Yes, wonderful. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to learn actually from this extraordinary community of scientists. And also, I think we should all like acknowledge how difficult it is to organize a, a, a meeting. And really, I think the, the poster thing reminded me of a few nightmares I had on my own. So I just wanted to discuss with you something that is a bit um, not exactly within the thematic of, of this work, but maybe something that is important to remember is actually this extraordinary beneficial relationship we have with the microbes that live with us and how in some cases disruption of this relationship can actually cause disease and there will be some beautiful talk later during this session. So just a couple of words about my own field of investigation for the people that do not want to think about the immune system. I just wanted to remind you something that was really extraordinary over the last few years, which is then when I was a graduate student, the world thought an immune system was actually here to be a weapon. And it was this idea of the immune system as an aggressor, really here to actually attack pathogen. But it was really a very small part of that the immune system does. What the immune system is, is really an extraordinary rheostat that is really constantly balancing and restoring the balance of the organism. And in fact, the immune system is a bridge between all the other physiological system, allowing to restore homeostasis in the context of challenges. So within this framework, my laboratory over the last few years has tried to understand how exogenous factors, such as the macrobiota, nutrition, and in some cases, even pathogen can be co-opted by the immune system as a way to achieve really optimal fitness of the host. Today, I'm going to discuss with you some really ongoing work in the laboratory to try to understand this extraordinary relationship in the microbiota and the immune system. And the work that we did a few years ago now really highlighted something quite intriguing at the time, which is that the microbiota that live with us, especially in the GI tract, but as, as we shown later in other tissues, plays a fundamental role in the education and function of the immune system. And in particular, early in life. If you do not have the right kind of microbe early in life, there is a profound dysregulation of the trajectory of the immune system. And this line of work really allows us and many others in the field to really uncover then the macrobiota serve that this form of adjuvant in the context of immune responses by promoting immune, immune responses to, oh, this is actually wonderful. I'm gonna come back. <laughs> an adjuvant to promote immunity to pathogen, really allowing the host to respond to infection. It is also an adjuvant in the context of vaccine in which the quality of the antibody and especially the glycosylation of the antibody is actually transformed at the macrobiota. Work that we have done in collaboration with investigators, the NIH highlighted an extraordinary role for the microbiota to serve as an adjuvant in the context of immune checkpoint therapy, showing that actually the kind of microbe you have in your gut can actually unleash positive immunity. But that, of course, we need to remember that this relationship can actually be dysregulated. And in many circumstances, aberrant reactivity to the microbiota or emergence of microbes that have more inflammatory potential can lead and amplify inflammatory disorders. So within this big framework of question, we decided over the last few years to focus on another angle of this question, which is not only how the microbiota control the immune system, but really how the immune system see the microbiota. And this may not be something that is a puzzle for you, but for me it was. It was because all what I have learned in the context of the immune system was done based on the framework of pathogen or infectious disease, aggressors. And the framework was actually delineated by people like Polly Singer or Charles Genoway that really helped us to understand then for the immune system to engage in the context of an infection, it needed to sense inflammation or tissue damage aggression. And this was really allowing the immune system to attack really the idea of the concept of cells versus non-self. So this was really fine as a concept, but this really didn't fit at all with the microbiota. The vast majority of the microbes that live with us are not aggressors. They are really those peaceful microbes living on the surface of our eye, the GI tract, the vaginal compartment, and so forth. And these are seen by the immune system, but they do not cause inflammation. We know from the work that actually Andrew McPherson and many others have done, that a microbiota present at the surface of a tissue engage T cells and antibody responses, but without causing inflammatory responses. So this was for us a paradox that didn't really you know, compute with actually this framework of this idea of danger model for the immune system. So today I'm gonna to discuss with you a couple of points related to this question, which is to try to understand how the microbiota is sensed by the immune system. And in particular, I'm gonna discuss with you what I refer to as the original sin. What is really the mechanism that allow the microbiota to engage in such a homeostatic peaceful way 
the immune system. And the second, why would you actually develop an immunity to the microbiota? These are not invaders. These are not, uh, these are not microbes that cause disease. So what could be the function of an immune responses that is not here to control an invading agent, but really clear to accumulate in the tissue? So just a couple of summary of some of the work and, and the model we have actually moved away over the last few years. So we have done and started our work in the GI tract, but over the last few years, we actually went to another tissue that is the skin. And the reason we actually started to work on the skin is for one first a fantastic graduate student, and it's always the beginning of every story, who came in my laboratory and really wanted to understand this question. But it turned out that it was really a clever idea because the microbiota in the skin is very low in biomass and really allow us to really utilize an environment in which it can impact the immune system, but you can more easily manipulate the composition and function of the microbiota. So what she really was able to do, and today she's actually faculty at NYU, what she was able to do is actually when she applied the microbe at the surface of the skin of an animal that contained the own microbiota, to show that actually the immune system develop and recognize these microbes and develop T cells responses that go back to the tissue, and this is actually seen here. These T cells are quite intriguing because they actually sit in the tissue, they do not cause inflammation, but they produce molecules that enhance antimicrobial peptide production by the epithelium, allowing the tissue to be broadly protected against infection. So a cognate specific responses to the microbiota can broadly en enhance antimicrobial defenses. What was also subsequently shown by other fellows in the laboratory that all have started their own group is that this class of immunity is different from immunity to pathogen. It is very plastic. It can change its function, it can change its profile based on circumstances. And if you have a damage in the tissue, the very same cells can now actually change their function and actually now promote uh, uh, regeneration and repair. So this is really an intriguing concept that was not actually understood before by the immune system is the fact that immunity to the microbiota is not here to control an invading agent, but here to broadly promote antimicrobial defense and regeneration of the tissue. But this actually led us with, of course, a million of questions, which is every time you do anything, this is more question and answers. And one of them was, how does it work? How does actually the immune system is able to sense that there is a microbe and why and how this is developing immune responses? So this was really a bit of an enigma. And then we had this even bigger enigma in the laboratory. And it was the work of Samira Tamutunur, when she actually did a RNA seq, when she basically looked at the gene expression signature of the tissue of an animal that had been associated with the bacteria at the surface of the skin. And I remind you, this is just a topical association of a gentle painting of few bacteria at the surface of the skin. What she actually saw is that very surprisingly, the tissue responded like it had been infected by a virus. And that was really, really bizarre. There was no inflammation. And everything we saw here was screaming antiviral responses. So we put a bacteria at the surface of the skin, no inflammation, and the tissues think that it's infected by a virus. So it was a bit paradoxical and strange, but this actually led us to rethink something quite extraordinary about our own wiring. Of course, we have the exogenous microbiota, the protozoan, the fungi, the viruses, all of them that actually are acquired and actually just live in our body surfaces. But what we also have is this extraordinary part of our genome that is composed of endogenous retroviruses. So evolutionary, we have been infected and some of those viruses became integrated in our genome. And of course, evolutionary, we have fragmented these elements. We have epigenetically controlled them. So they're no longer infectious. However, some of those elements maintain transcriptional activity and can be expressed in some, in some phase and actually control innate responses. So the fact that we have these antiviral responses when you add a bacteria pointed to maybe a bizarre link between the exogenous microbiota and this endogenous viral. So to address this question, Jalma and Sid in the laboratory teamed up. Sid is a computational biologist and Jalma was a bench scientist. And they did very simple experiment where they took a new microbe, applied them at the surface of the skin, and actually were able to see a discrete, nonetheless significant upregulation of few retro elements at the surface of the skin, at the level of keratinocytes. So this actually pointed to the possibility and when you see a new microbe, and I remind you, and when you have shake the hands today, you acquire the microbe. If you have changed hotel room, you acquire new microbe. That's actually is coupled with actually this tickling of these endogenous retroviruses. So what would be important? Endogenous retroviruses, which I remind you are 10% of your genome, in case you think that you are that important, a large fraction of the genome is actually viruses and the rest is actually, anyway, a lot of what retro elements. <laughs> So those retro elements have a life cycle. And if there is a reverse transcriptase, which is actually the enzyme that will allow to convert this element into DNA, this element can become DNA that will accumulate in the cytoplasm and actually tell the cells that it's infected by a virus. So this is what we actually tested. 
is those are those threat to element make the cell think it's infected, allowing now the immune system to actually be engaged. And to do that, we did something very simple. Actually, Sid and Jalma did something. I do absolutely nothing in the lab. What they did is they used transcriptase inhibitor, the same drug that I use for the prevention or treatment of HIV. And this will block the ability of DNA to accumulate within the tissue. And what you can see here is if you, if you have an animal control, they have very low amount of T cells in the skin. Remember, our animals are way too clean, living in a way too clean environment. If you add a new microbe at the surface of the skin, immune response is mounted, they develop those CD8. If you block reverse transcriptase, therefore the ability of those viruses, retroviruses to become DNA, now you block the ability of the host to sense that there is a new bacteria. So this is actually an image that actually um, show this, this better. If you apply Staphylococcus, which is actually Staphylococcus epidermidis, of course, a microbe that all of us have, by the way, this microbe actually induces T cells accumulation in the epidermis, CD4 and CD8, and I told you before, they are beneficial for the host. If you block reverse transcriptase, inhibit reverse transcriptase function of the host, you now have an impairment of the ability of the host to mount T cell response to the microbiota, and in fact, impair the ability of the microbiota to now have all this beneficial impact on the immune system. So to conclude this part, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that there is this really, really remarkable coordination between the system to allow the immune system to respond positively to the microbiota. And strangely enough, the microbiota found a way to co-opt those really, you know, retroviruses that are really part of our genome as a way to really establish dialogue with the host immune system. And it's really this three-part dialogue between the retro elements, the bacteria, and the immune system that set the threshold of activation of tissue and allow the immune system to actually be regulated within tissue. So we had done this work in the context of the skin, but we have actually ongoing work in the laboratory showing this is not relevant only to the skin, but also very much true in the context of the lung, the GI tract, and the vaginal compartment. And this relationship had actually consequences on the ability of the host to develop response to pathogen. And we are now exploring this interaction. So the model we have is the following one that we are now further exploring mechanistically. When a microbe is sensed by the immune system, it engages canonical innate sensor, just TLRs, Downstream of TLR is the upregulation of very few elements. And one thing that is remarkable is that every cell in our body can express different retro elements. And nobody really understands how and why this is regulated. What is also very interesting for many of you that actually think about cross species, the class of retro element we have between species is actually highly distinct. So there is an enormous kaleidoscope of potential regulation that can actually influence the immune system. So downstream of this response is a recognition of those innate uh, ligand DNA that can be now sensed by the C-gasting pathway, leading to a mini hotspot that tells the tissue it's infected, but not strong enough to create inflammation, allowing the immune system to actually be engaged. And what we also have found, which is actually published, and I'm not going to show this data, is if you change the diet of an animal, you change completely the circumstances of this relationship. At steady state, you sense the microbiota in this positive way, leading to actually those positive responses. If you have a high fat diet and an obese animal, now the very same bacteria that you apply on the skin trigger an aberrant expression of retro elements, and now this is actually causing disease. So we're now very, very interested to try to understand really how the threshold of activation of tissue and the ability of the tissue to respond positively, antimicrobial defense or inflammation can actually be at least in part also controlled by this tonic control of retro elements within the tissue. So this is actually the model we have right now, which is the fact that retro, retro elements really are the element that control the threshold activation of the tissue and regulate the ability to sense positively or in an inflammatory way, exogenous sensors. So I'm just going to give you a couple of slides about some work we are really excited about, and it's really quite preliminary, but nonetheless, this is a, the place to discuss that. And this is actually our attempt to actually explore this question in humans. So we're very, very lucky at the clinical center of the NIH to have two things. First, to have a clinical center. Two, to have also Kevin Hall. Kevin Hall is a physicist by training who's actually doing dietary intervention in humans because, of course, he's very interested in energy and actually this physical aspect of, of metabolism. So we're able to pair with him and actually to look at the immune system of healthy individual placed in the clinical center for two months quite amazing, actually. People went to stay in the hospital for two months and had their meal actually provided to them. And the reason this is a unique uh, experiment is because this is the first time, actually, there is such a highly controlled dietary intervention in humans. When you do a dietary intervention in a non-controlled settings, which means at home, everybody is cheating, including me. So this is actually the extraordinary data set. And I think I'm going to tell you how remarkable this is for a few reasons. 
So people were actually treated, not treated, fed ketogenic or actually a vegan diet. And look at the, we looked at the immune system. So I'm just gonna show you one slide and ignore all the jargon. This is not what this is about, but look at how striking this is. This is a two weeks dietary intervention on vegan. If you look at the red, that means actually upregulated. And this is actually what happened when you place someone on a vegan diet for two weeks. You can see that almost every arm of the innate immune system have been upregulated. In contrast, the very same individual placed on the ketogenic diet now has an upregulation of the adaptive immune system. So innate immune system will be the one that is the more primitive form of immune system. The adaptive will be the one that is more antibody response and T cells. So the reason I'm showing you that is, is I'm gonna explain why it comes to ERV is because I just wanted to highlight how remarkable is the impact of nutrition on the immune system and how we have really, really underestimated the power of nutrition to actually shape the immune system. If you do a drug treatment based on the heterogeneity of humans, you're not gonna have such a conserved response with every single individual going the same way. So we're really excited about this kind of study and now moving forward to try to understand the link with vaccine, but let's go back to ERV. The reason I'm showing you that is because one thing that you guys need to actually acknowledge, not only in terms of diversity, is how human diversity is actually able to respond to pathogen. Each of us have a different level of expression of ERV. And I remind you, 10% of our genomes, each of them actually have the possibility to activate the immune system. And what we find is not only all of us have different level of expression or different family that are expressed, but the class of gene that is the most affected by nutrition are actually the ERVs. So we have no idea at this stage if actually what we see, which is basically nutrition impact on the immune system is caused by ERV, but nonetheless, I think this raises the intriguing possibility that actually nutrition or inflammation or other element may change the ERV status of activation, thereby changing the ability of the host to respond to exogenous stressors, including pathogens. So we're actually moving forward to try to understand this mechanism, but I think this is something important to take in account, you know, ability to understand antiviral responses in particular in humans. So do I have enough time or I can wrap it up? Yeah, okay. so I have five more minutes. So, okay, good. So I'm just gonna very quickly on, on some work that was done recently by Michelle in the laboratory. So Michelle came in the laboratory, tried to explore new function of immunity to the microbiota. And he was really, really interested by the, the following mechanism. So when people in the field of, regen of, of regeneration or tissue repair think about repair, they think through the lens of one cell at a time, which I think for people that think about ecology is nonsense. So when a tissue is actually affected, you not only allow to acknowledge all the inflammation, but you also need to repair every single piece of the puzzle. You need the vasculature, the lymphatic, the nerve, the epithelium. So what Michel actually postulated is something really intriguing is that maybe the macrobiota, because of this coevolutionary partnership has found a way to tap into this multi-system repair and really allow the system to not only repair, but really regenerate and all the elements of the, of the puzzle. And bizarrely enough, he decided to explore Staphyrus. Staphyrus may be seen as a pathogen by some of you. The reality is Staphyrus colonized 30 to 40% of all humans at any given time and is part of a microbiota and only few of those isolates can actually cause disease. So because this microbe can in some case cause disease, Michel postulated that this microbe may be partly good at inducing this multi-system repair to prepare the system for future damage. So to make a long story short, he made actually mice in which all the T cells can recognize the staphyrus, and he looked at them accumulating within the skin compartment. And not surprisingly, those cells develop what is called a type 17 phenotype, which is very much aligned with immunity to the microbiota. But what was actually, well, but what was actually more intriguing is when Michel was able to visualize using two photon microscopy, how these cells behave in the tissue. And these are, they are in yellow. And what you see in purple is the sensory neurons, the sensory fibers in the neurons. And when he was able to show is that the T cells that are specific for this microbe, so the TCR is for the microbe, are in close contact to the sensory neuron in the skin. And this actually is quantified on the right when you can see that in close proximity to the sensory neuron. So this pointed to the idea that maybe this immunity to the microbiota could control sensory neuron function. So to address this question, it did what we always do when we have no idea what we're doing, which is to take the cells and doing a gene expression profile. And what he was able to see is that the T cells that recognize the microbiota at the surface of the skin are actually able to express genes that are compatible with regeneration of nerves and actually nerve interaction. So this actually led Michel to test the possibility that actually the sensor, this T cell to the microbiota can actually be engaged in the regeneration of nerves, which 
for people that may not be in the medical field here is actually an outstanding need for the clinical need because nerves are, of course, complicated things to regenerate. So what Michel actually did is the following. He applied the staph at the surface of the skin and a few weeks later did a very gentle punch biopsy. And you can see that the CD4 T cells, the lymphocyte, accumulate at the edge of the skin if you have staph aris. And you can see in purple here the, 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 the fibers of the nerves, and you can see the densification of those nerves post-association with staph aris. So this actually pointed to the fact that when you have staph aris on the surface of the skin, bizarrely enough, this actually allows the tissue to regenerate faster, and in particular, the nerves. So I realize this may be a bit jargony, so I'm going to just go on, on explain what I'm trying to say here. So what he actually did is to try to see, is it caused by the bacteria itself? Or is it caused by the T cells generated in the context of this response? And in this specific model, what he did, he generated a mice in which the T cells can no longer develop within the skin. They can no longer develop the program within the skin. So this actually will be animals that are naive with a punch biopsy when you can see regeneration of the nerves. You can see the dramatic effect staph aris has in the context of regeneration of nerves. And you can see that the T cells cannot go anymore within the skin. This regeneration is abolished. So, T cells, immunity to the microbiota, regenerate the nerves. And finally, you wanted to see if the nerves themselves could actually sense the cytokine produced by lymphocyte. And this was actually unexpected because nerves are not supposed to really respond to actually lymphocyte themselves. What actually Michel did to address this question, he removed the receptor for IL-17, which is actually the receptor, the, the cytokine produced by the T cells on the nerve by crossing the animals. And you can see here the animal that I control, which means the nerves are intact. And here the nerves actually have been deleted from the IL-17 receptor, which is a molecule produced by the T cells. You can see the regeneration in the context of staph aris association, and you can see how significantly this is decreased if the nerve themselves cannot respond to an immunity to the microbiota. So strangely enough, immunity to the skin microbiota is able to actually produce T cells that produce cytokine that can promote the regeneration of nerves. So what actually Michel has found is actually if you have microbe and we all have microbe and you acquire new microbe all the time in the surface of the skin, but also other body surfaces, you always develop immunity against them. And this immunity actually that is a T cells stay in the tissue and they stay for, for months and months. They are sitting there close to the sensory neurons. If you have a damage, now the T cells that are specific for this microbe sense that there is a damage and infection and are reactivated and expand and produce a large amount of IL-17 that is acting directly on the neurons to promote the regeneration. And this really allows what, I'm, what actually Michel referred to this multi-system repair. Why it does that? Because sensory neurons are fundamentally important for touch, for the protection, but they also coordinate responses and regeneration of other systems. The sensory neuron actually are the scaffold that help actually regeneration of the vasculature and the epithelium. So by targeting the sensory neuron, the microbiota is able to really promote this whole generation of the tissue beyond just the sensory neurons. So in conclusion, I just mentioned to you this um, really intriguing relationship between microbe, and I think we're only scratching the surface of the complication of this relationship. The microbiota, very strangely, is tapping into this genome of ours that is actually composed of retro elements and is using that as the adjuvant to be recognized by the immune system. The downstream consequence of it is adaptive immunity, the very same immunity we develop in the context of vaccine. It's a classical antigen-specific responses. And the power of this adaptive immunity, it is long-lived, it is plastic, and it can actually disseminate across all the different tissues, making really the impact of the microbiota systemic. It's an immunity that enhances antimicrobial defenses, enhance regeneration of the vasculature, of the sensory neuron, but also of the epithelium. So in conclusion, what I wanted to uh, tell you is that the way we do things in the laboratory is through very much observation. And we feel that actually observing the relationship between the microbiota and the immune system in the context of health and disease can be really an amazing source of inspiration to try to understand the logic of how tissue are wired, how we have co-evolved with microbes, but maybe also to devise therapy that are very much really lodged into this ecological interaction. And in particular, for example, what I've mentioned before, this unexpected role of IL-17 on regeneration of neuron is something now we are testing in the context of clinical trial. So I think it is really exciting and I think there is very much to learn. And as I mentioned before, um, our work is just to observe and not really a big partisan of hypothesis-driven science, it's very observation-driven science. 
So on that, I have to thank all the fantastic people who have done the work. I mentioned uh, Jalma and Sid, fantastic team, both of them moving on their own independent position, and Michelle, who's actually just signed up on, on Mount, Mount Sinai in New York, and many fantastic people we have worked over the last few years. And thank you all for your attention. So we have time for a few questions. Paul? Yeah, that was fascinating. So uh, instead of asking a million questions, I'll just ask one. That keto versus vegan diet, that was striking. And I'm wondering if you think any role of plant viruses could be at play, because I know Forrest Rower and others showed this remarkable, you have a bunch of plant viruses that enter through ingesting plant material and yeah. they exit and they're still able to be infectious when you isolate them from fecal material. So I presume you were not autoclaving the food. Yeah. And basically it's a general question about what was in the food and do you think that that at all had any relevance? So you're absolutely correct. I think what we need to remember to what we ingest, we also ingesting, you know, for example, it was shown for in, in Japan, for example, there is actually algae that can be found accumulating within the GI tract and how much this could influence the immune system remains unknown. So your point is incredibly interesting. What we find in a vegan diet that was really interesting is this dramatic enhancement of ligands, microbial ligands in the circulation, like an enhanced LPS stimulation and enhanced CLA4. How much this actually reflects what was ingested as opposed to the activity of the microbiome remain to be addressed. But I think this is really where we want to go next. Where we really want to go is actually define, further define the complexity of, of our diet, knowing exactly what is there and trying to really understand the interplay between the microbiota and so forth. But the point I wanted to put there is that this is a remarkable tool to shape immunity. And if we learn how to do that, we may actually become part of actually complementing therapy, not as a primary therapy, but how do you influence pathological state? How do you influence responses? Hi, uh, it was a really interesting talk. And with regards to the microbiota promoted repair, do you have a sense for whether that's something that is, that increased repair is beneficial to the microbiome or is it more of a, the host senses that these terrible pathogens are out there so it has to repair quickly? Well, it, why can it be both? I mean, the reality is actually, we are home to the microbes. A lot of the microbes that live in our skin have no other home than our skin. So the reality is, you know, for the microbe to promote regeneration and allow the system to rebuild is really at the advantage. For the microbe to promote antimicrobial defense, it is because it allows the host to compete for them to make sure that the niche is actually safe. So I think this is likely to be mutually beneficial. I don't think we can ask the microbes the advice there, but I suspect this is, <laughs> this is both. I, um, yeah, that was just fascinating, and I think it raises so many questions about uh, human autoimmune diseases, but the, the one thing that's the easiest question for me to formulate is perhaps about uh, cellulitis and staph, staph aureus cause cellulitis is often associated with very severe neuropathic pain. Yeah. Um, have you been, or are you able to look at sort of the pathological process in human skin tissues and see that nerve regeneration? And if so, can that yeah. with therapies? Or so that's actually a super interesting question. Now you're referring to when staphylococcus become a pathogen. So what we have actually done is, of course, as you know, and many of people who are working on bacteriology do know that actually those microbes are highly diverse and actually the vast majority of staphylococcus will not cause infection. If we use a microbe that can cause infection, we can now actually induce aberrant regeneration of nerves and now cause actually pain. So what actually turns to be a beneficial thing when it's actually quiescent with that breach in the barrier, when it's an infection and you have all this immunity full blown, now the nerves become aberrant and they start to infiltrate the epidermis and now sensation is heightened. So all these processes that are natural processes that are needed can actually be co-opted for pathological, in pathological state and create, which we know staphylococcus is highly painful, yeah. yeah time, for, time for one more. I had a question about the diet study. Sorry, I'll stand up <laughs> all the way in the back. Um, so did you measure changes in the microbiome with shifts associated with the diet? And then I had a question since that was the immune changes were taken at two weeks. Are those transient dynamics yeah. with the shift or kind of longer term persisting phenotypes? Yeah, so of course we have, so we're wrapping up the story. And of course, we looked at the microbiome. That was the primary thing. And what is interesting, although, 
we don't know exactly why the ketogenic imposed really drastic remodeling of the macrobiota, but the vegan didn't. And we're not really sure it's because there is really indeed a differential impact or because the kind of microbiome sampling we're collecting are not the right one. There is more and more evidence that the most relevant microbe really are likely to be within the small intestine, which is not a tissue that is easily accessed. So today there is actually new, in fact, in Stanford, there's some beautiful approaches using those capsules or tubes where you can really very much now collect along the way of the GI tract, and that will probably help us having a deeper understanding. Your point about transient versus permanent, unfortunately, the study was not designed for that. You know, having, being a mouse immunologist, I'm like, what do you mean we couldn't do that no you can't so we're actually now wrapping up a new story we're going to be able to actually explore how transient how permanent and how long we need to do to have really significant remodeling of, of, of tissue function yeah thank you very much for your attention Excellent. thank you very much